Now, let's talk about CD30 positive T cell lymphoproliferative disorder. And I know that sounds like a made up name, but that's actually what we're supposed to call this by the, the most recent WHO. But this sounds like a, a made up descriptive term that someone you know invented last Tuesday. But actually this is the name that we use to encompass a group of things that can look basically identical microscopically and really require more information from the clinical perspective usually and from additional workup to be able to sort them out, okay? So here's case one. The patient has multiple red papules, kind of juicy and edematous, and they come and go over time. They're waxing and waning. You guys know as dermatology residents, this is the classic, uh, classic buzzword description, right, for lymphomatoid papulosis, these crops of papules that come and go over time, right? So microscopically, what we see is an infiltrate. There's a little sponge, uh, spongiosis with this one, but there's basically an infiltrate that's in the superficial dermis, kind of goes away as you get deeper down. If you have a good imagination, you could imagine it's wedge-shaped or upside-down triangle-shaped, if you have a really good imagination. But basically, it's top-heavy, right? It's an infiltrate at the top of the dermis and not as much in the deep dermis. And then um, we, have, uh, we have here, as we go in closer, you can see there's a mixture of cells here, cells with, with abundant cytoplasm. When I see cells that are kind of big and have a lot of cytoplasm, the first thing that crosses my mind is maybe they're histiocytes. But other things that can make big cells with a bunch of cytoplasm in the dermis are CD30 positive uh, lymphoproliferative cells, okay? Or reactive cells sometimes too, reactive lymphocytes too can kind of look like this. So here we do have these, these large cells that kind of look like histiocytes a little bit. They've got some atypical big nuclei, prominent nucleoli in some of these. There's also scattered lymphocytes around in here too, which is commonly the case. And then there can be a mixture of other cells, small lymphocytes, sometimes even neutrophils um, mixed in here, okay? But the, the thing what we're seeing is uh, a scattered large cells plus a mixed inflammatory background, often with the eosinophils, that's classic for and then here, CD30 is going to be positive in these big cells. I don't think I have a picture. I can't remember. Uh, but these big cells will be positive for CD30. So when you put all that together with the clinical history, this is lymphomatoid papulosis. And if you like to, to, some people like to subtype it by letter. But again, it started with like A, B, and C. And now it's like D, E, F. I mean, we'll get to Z eventually and then start using like Greek letters, I think, because there's so much alphabet soup. But I mean, the, the point of these is that, that these are not so much important for the clinician, the treating physician, but they're more important that these are all variants of the same kind of disease that look very different microscopically. So I always like to say we split diagnoses into different subtypes for three reasons in, in medicine or in pathology at least. Number one, and the most important, is that there's a difference in patient care, either in prognosis of how the patient's likely to do or treatment, how the patient's going to get treated, you know, whether surgically or with chemotherapy or something else. So we split things. And the most important reason to split things out is because it's going to change the way the patient um, is treated or the patient outcome. Number two is we split things because there's a difference in the microscopic pattern. And it's we make a, a point of saying, oh, this is this weird subtype of entity X to make sure the pathologist remembers, oh yeah, this one looks different, but it's actually the same thing, right? And so that's kind of where we are, I, to, in my thinking, with lymphomatoid papulosis. A lot of different patterns microscopically that all are similar in the way that they're treated and the way they behave clinically, okay? And the third reason we split is because people and academics have to get published, okay? So you write about a new entity and then you write a paper about it. And I'm kind of joking, but I'm also kind of telling the truth. And you guys hopefully are laughing a little bit at home and it's funny because there's some truth in it, all right? And I, hey, I'm guilty too, all right? So this would be the lymphomatoid papulosis type A, which is when you have scattered CD30 positive cells. Now, the problem with this is that on biopsy only, like this case is pretty good. It's got some big atypical cells, but anytime I get a kind of dense lymphoid infiltrate, if I do a CD30, I'm going to find some scattered larger CD30 positive cells. Well, what do I do with that? The thing is, is that immunoblasts, which is the fancy word for reactive lymphocytes, reactive B cells or T cells, they usually stay positive for CD30. They're kind of activated T cells. And so th this is what my heme path uh, expert friends have told me. So the thing is, is that a lot of inflammatory reactive processes have scattered in large cells that are CD30 positive. So when I see that and I don't feel like there are like too many of them or that they're clustered together um, or the clinical doesn't really make sense, I just put it in my microscopic description that, um, that there are some scattered CD30 positive cells that I favor to be reactive lymphocytes and, um, and that I think that the number of those is, is 
normal for the density of this inflammatory infiltrate, okay? But if I have some suspicion, sometimes I'll put in there, I think this is reactive, but you know, lymphomatoid papulosis would be a possibility in the right clinical setting because maybe this is just the first onset and they don't have waxing and waning papules yet because they just presented recently. And maybe if you follow them over six months or a year, you'll say, oh, wow, they do have the waxing and waning course and maybe this is just LYP. So sometimes if I see it and I'm thinking about it, I'll bring it up in my comments so the dermatologist just knows to keep an eye on the patient and see see how their how the process goes over time. Lots of other things have big CD30 positive reactive lymphocytes, including arthropod bite reactions and various other reactive processes. Scabies, oh, scabies can totally mimic lymphoma. It can get so revved up and crazy. I've had one where I, we were actually doing um, doing the, the uh, immunohistochemical stains, and I think it was actually on the CD30 positive immunostain slide. Guess what we saw? The scabies mite on the surface. So it popped up when we did the immunostains, and we were like, ah, it was just that. So in any case, there's lots of stuff that can be tricky. And a telling reactive from neoplastic in lymphoid infiltrates in the skin to me is one of the, the most vexing and difficult and frustrating things because it's really hard sometimes to be sure. All right. So now this, this is a patient that has multiple red papules that wax and wane over time. So same clinical story, but now microscopically, well, whoa, we got big ulceration with crust on the top. And then we have this very uh, infiltrate that's top heavy like the last one, but way more dense. And even from low power, you can see these monster ugly cells, huge cells that are in there and going close. It's like a sheet of the nastiest, ugliest big nasty cells you can imagine mitosis 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 everywhere i mean this has got to be evil bad lymphoma right well the patient has multiple papules and they go away over time so in that case with that history and of course these are going to all be cd30 positive so this would also be lymphomatoid papulosis again it has to have that proper behavior and sometimes at the beginning we don't know how it's going to behave so this is why we use cd30 positive t-cell lymphoproliferative disorder to encompass these things because it often takes some follow-up to find out what it's actually going to be all right so these are sheets of ugly cd30 positive large atypical cells and so that's um, that's uh, the, the type C. Type B is is a one that I, I personally, I don't know if I've ever seen a really good example. It's supposed to look like mycosis fungoides microscopically and have some some, uh, page, or some epidermotropic kind of pattern, but I've, I've not seen a good example of that yet. I usually see either type A or type C in my practice. Okay, so now this patient has a single nodule that's ulcerated in red, it's been there six months, it's a huge mass, sheets of ugly cells. When we go closer, there they are. They look ugly and nasty, just like the last case. Of course, they're diffusely CD30 positive. So what's this? Well, this is gonna be primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It looks to me microscopically identical to LYP type C. The only way really to know, looking at them, is if over time, the the you get multiple lesions that come and go that's probably lyp type c if it's solitary um, probably primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma although sometimes they can get multiple lesions sometimes they can regress on their own it's a little complicated and um sometimes there's some molecular that can be helpful in sorting these out too but we're not going to go into that in this talk so the the thing that's important especially for pathologists uh, watching this is that the problematic thing is that there's another disease unrelated to this one that's also called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and that's nodal or systemic type ALCL. And the problematic thing is they both are composed of large, ugly cells that are CD30 positive. So it seems like they would be the same thing, but they're not. The ones that are nodal usually um, are ALK1 positive. They have an ALK gene uh, abnormalities and they, um, they're going to be positive on ALK immunostain. In fact, that's what ALK stands for, anaplastic lymphoma kinase, ALK. And ALK is positive in a variety of other things. In the skin, not very many things. That Some of the things that you can see ALK in just for if you're making a list to remember, um, epithelioid fibrous histiocytomas are ALK positive. Some spitzoid lesions are ALK positive, like spitz nevus and sometimes spitz melanoma. Um, ALK is also positive uh, sometimes uh, in angiomatoid fibrous histiocytoma, which is a weird intermediate malignant potential tumor that is positive for ALK um, on um, immunostain, but is actually negative, I believe, for ALK fusions um, by uh, molecular testing. And then also ALK can be positive in inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which is usually a thing that's seen in the viscera, the internal organ areas and the retroperitoneum and stuff, um, but rarely can present in the skin 
And I've got videos about some of those entities you can go and check out if you need more. They're, these are all pretty rare esoteric things. Okay. So anyway, what I usually do in these cases is I will do the ALK. If the ALK is positive, then it's almost certain that they have systemic nodal ALCL that's secondarily spread to the skin. So the, the more frustrating problem comes up with the fact that not all systemic um, ALCL is ALK positive. There is a s smaller subset that's ALK negative, and that subset tends to be more aggressive. So nodal ALCL that's ALK positive has a pretty good prognosis, actually, but the ALK negative form, the prognosis is worse and it's more aggressive. So if that spreads to the skin, it would look just like this. So these patients, you know, if, if they've got one lesion, I, I often want them to monitor for, does the patient have B symptoms, you know, maybe palpate and see if they have any enlarged nodes. Um, it, it may not, it, different people have different views about how far to work these patients up, but working them up to make sure they don't have an internal lymphoma is not a bad idea, especially if they have any other symptoms to suggest that. So it's good to keep an eye on those, uh, those patients. And again, uh, you can uh, ask your, your friendly local lymphoma expert for much more detailed guidance on this, but I'm just trying to teach you the morphology and how to approach these microscopically. So how I sign these out, and again, now I, I'm lucky I work with really awesome cutaneous heme path experts uh, like Dr. Junkins Hopkins, so I can show her and get her guidance. But what I've done over time in the past is I put this, the line diagnosis as CD30 positive T-cell lymphoproliferative disorder. Comment that all of these things could look the same microscopically. Right. LYP, primary cutaneous anaplastic large cell lymphoma, systemic nodal ALCL involving the skin, like if it's the ALK negative type, and even CD30 positive large cell transformation of mycosis fungoides. And on a biopsy alone, it's essentially impossible to sort those out um, if you have a sheet of ugly CD30 positive cells, okay? You cannot look at that and say, oh, it's large cell MF. The only way you can have large cell MF is if the patient has like background regular MF or a history of MF, okay? So really the, all the clinical pieces have to be put together to sort it out. So uh, this is the way I end up managing this. And if I have more information, then I can sometimes be more specific. Uh, it depends on the, the context of the individual case. And I think that's the end of that topic. Any questions um, about that? Yes. Um, I'm curious, for cases uh, like the ALCL one you were talking about, uh, do you normally put those recommendations for workup in your sign-out, or is it expected that you do that? Well, a lot of people have different views about how much a pathologist should say in their comment about what should be done clinically. So it depends on the situation. In general, I tend to, I tend to, especially with, with this topic here, I do tend to say, like I've had times in the past, I used to take consults. I, d I don't anymore in my job because it was just getting too busy, but I used to take consults. So sometimes I'd be getting it from someone. They had, you know, very little clinical information. Sometimes it was coming from a non-dermatologist. So in those cases, I say, look, the patient needs to have a full body skin exam and they need to have additional workup done. So yeah, I personally feel comfortable putting those things in my report. And in, I've been doing that for eight years now of recommending what should be done clinically. And I don't think I've ever had anyone come back and tell me, how dare you tell me what to do? Because most people are like, oh, thanks. You're, you're making a weird diagnosis of something I've either never seen or rarely seen. And you're telling me what the next step is to do. So that often helps people because it saves them having to go look it up and figure out, you know, what's the best thing to approach this. They've got like a next step, right? That's easily there. So, and especially when I, when I sign out reports of like, you know, cause I also do bone and soft tissue pathology in addition to derm path. So when it's a sarcoma or something, you know, in general, unless the person treating them is a orthopedic oncologist or otherwise a sarcoma expert, I have more familiarity with those diseases than the vast majority of doctors do. So I feel very comfortable saying this is the next steps that need to be done. And I feel like that's that to me, that's comfortable and it's good for patient care. But I also think that it's totally understandable that some pathologists are not comfortable doing that and just leave it up to the treating doc. So there's different styles and approaches, but personally, yeah, if, if I know something that could be useful to be done, um, and I feel that that might help the patient and help my, my clinical colleagues to know how to best, you know, next steps for the patient. I feel like why not share that information? Now, I, I, sometimes I soften how I say it. Like these could be, you know, if clinically indicated, I might do this and that, you know, that way I'm not tying anyone's hands. But, um, but yeah, and, and it seems like people are, uh, tend to at least tolerate it. Maybe, maybe some people don't like it, but no one's come back to complain to me that I can think of. Yeah, it's great to know. I have a question. Um, yes. So you mentioned the CD30 being a marker for the immunoblast, which if I recall, I think that's like something that implies like it's been active in the antigen. It's already like left the germinal center. And does that imply a certain, uh, are these like uh, derived from that lineage then or, or did these CD30 positive hmm. 
the liver disorders that you're falling asleep at 30, like independently, and that's just like completely you no know, different. That's a great question. I have no idea. I I have only the very basic grasp of, of immunology that I've retained kind of a framework of from med school. The intricate details of just even normal, uh, you know, uh, immunology uh, or immune physiology are way over my head. And then the lymphomas, I think, become even more complicated because people do talk a lot about, oh, if something comes from the germinal center or post-germinal center. But I, yeah, that stuff is beyond me. So I really don't know. That's a really great question. I, I suspect though that, you know, because the, these are driven by, or well, oh, no, I, I don't know. I, I'll just say, I don't know. Let's, let me just be honest. So, but maybe that's a good question to ask someone who is really into to skin lymphomas. Maybe they'll be able to uh, help us sort this out. Cool. Thanks. Just, just wondering, because I was wondering if it had certain implications as far as like potentially uh, management treatment that kind of yeah i don't know and i don't know a lot actually about um for for lyp and alcl i don't know a ton about how it's treated i know there are kind of some different approaches and they i think a lot of times they tend to be a bit conservative um but you know i have seen cases though where they were like large fungating mass and it was it was problematic for the patient so so but i don't really know the the current best practices for treating uh, those patients and there are CD30 inhibiting uh, drugs, you know, like monoclonal antibodies. And I know that like at least for CD30 positive large cell MF, um, I know some of the derms I've worked with who, who specialized in lymphoma, uh, they, would, they would use those drugs uh, for, for treating that. But as far as if that's routinely used for like LYP or, or cutaneous ALCL, I'm not, really, I'm not really sure how often those kind of drugs get used.